Everybody, we're going to start at the seat. Can everyone hear us from Zoom? Just raise your hand. Okay, I'm going to be speaking about turning the corner, the joy of Tuba. So, how did we get here? And why, why are we sitting on the floor? And why are we fasting? And why are we having this sad day? Where did it start? So, as many of us know, it, it all came from the Marauders. Them, the spies were given this job to go into Eretz Yisrael. The Jews were just on the door of entering Eretz Yisrael. This had been the, the trajectory of the Jewish people from the beginning of, of our history, right? You look at Sefer Bereshis, you know, it's the land, the land, the land, the land, the land. Avram gets promised the land. Yitzchak gets is promised the land. Yaakov is promised the land. Everywhere you look, the land, the land. This, this is the goal. The spies go in, they look around, they come back, and they say, yeah, you know, it's got some good produce, you know, it's, 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 a, you know, it's a pretty nice place, you know, uh, you know, uh, uh, milk and honey, but we're, we're not going to be able to get in here. We're not going to be able to defeat these people. And these are the 10 of the 12 spies, leaders, representatives of each of the tribes. And except for two of them, they're all saying bad things about Eretz Israel. And the you know, Kaleb ben Yifuna, that no, it's not true, we could do this. You know, we've got Hashem on our side, we're gonna do this. And the people go to sleep that night and they're crying. The nation is crying on that night. And the measure says, Hashem says, you cried for nothing. You cried for nothing. And you're going to cry for generations. And so the next morning, you know, they get up and they're going to, oh, let's go back to Mitzrayim. Much better there. Yeah, let's go back to Mitzrayim. And, and again, the Kalev and, and Yahushua try to convince them, no, no. And they want to stone them. And they're about to stone them. And Hashem comes down. And he says, how long do I have to put up with this people? How long do I have to suffer with, with, with this people? How, do I, how long do I have to put up with it? And he says to Moshe, I'm going to destroy them all. And I'm going to start again with you. I bet it's only the men, though. Right. OK. What? What so it's, it's only, only the men. The men. <laughs> so <laughs> so um, Moshe Rabbeinu becomes the you know, the, the, the excellent defense attorney that he has to be so many times, right? And Moshe Rabbeinu, you know, talks to Hashem and convinces him. And basically he's begging Hashem not to make Chilo Hashem, right? He says, if you kill these people, then the way that the nations will understand this is that you didn't have the strength, you didn't have the capability to bring the people into the land and therefore you killed them. So don't do that. And then Moshe says, Hashem, Erechacha, um, er, excuse me, Hashem, Erecha Payim. Hashem is slow to anger. Um, the Rav Chesed, he's great in kindness. Nase Avon, the Pesha, the Naket. That he, that he, he, he uh, forgives iniquity and, and purposeful sin, and he absolves. The Jewish people from from sin, and of course, this is the formula that you know Hashem taught Moshe Rabbeinu at the after the Chita Egel. This is how you bring Hashem to forgive the Jewish people, and Hashem says, "Salachti kibarecha, I'll forgive you according to your words." And but he but he says doesn't mean that you're getting off. Okay, it doesn't mean that I'm, I'm forgiving you, I'm absolving you of your sin, but it doesn't mean that there's not going to be any punishment. And the punishment is that for 40 years, you're going to be wandering in this desert. And none of you, none of the men over the age of 20 is going to enter into the land. 
right? All of you are gonna die here in the desert. And uh, that's quite a, quite a punishment. And that day was the ninth of Av. And that's how we got here. So, and this became kind of the, the template for many terrible things that befell the Jewish people, right? The, the Mishnah in Pana says, the Tisha B'Av, Nigzar um, So it was, it was decreed upon our people that they would not enter the land. The Harab Habayat Hamishonav Hashniyad, the first base of Mikdash was destroyed, and the second base of Mikdash was destroyed. The Nilkeda Beitar, Beitar was, was captured and destroyed, and the people were slaughtered. And then it says, the Harsha Ha'ir, the city, Ha'ir, meaning Yerushalayim, was, was plowed over. And Nisha Nichnas Av Ma'atin Bisimcha. When you enter the month of Av, the, your, your joy is, is minimized. So, do you ever think about like, how did they die? You know, like here we have, we have this, this verdict. You have 600,000 people who have been given this death sentence that they're to die over the next 40 years. How, how did it work? You know, they're like eating their man sandwich and, you know, and they're, they choke, you know, you know how, how did it work? So th this is, so, so this, this is how, how it went. Moshe decreed, go out and dig. And the first year, Tisha B'Av, the night, at night, 600,000 people went out and dug a grave. And they went to sleep in that grave. And then the next morning, Moshe said, arise and separate, meaning separate the dead from the living. And 600,000 people stood up minus 15,000 who had died. Imagine this, 15,000 people died. That's, that has to affect every single tribe, right? That's a lot of people's fathers and brothers and uncles and do you think they cried? The Chiel and Dolro, do you think they cried? There was a lot of crying. And, and then it happened the next year and the next year and the next year and the next year and the next year, every single year dig your grave wherever they were in their travels, they would dig their grave, sleep in it that night, and 15,000 people would not wake up. And that's how the, this punishment that Hashem had put on the Jewish people came, came to be. Um, it, it, it talks about this in the Gemara. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I'm not sure I could get this point. Yeah, right. <laughs> It's a good point. <laughs> well, they're in the wilderness. So it's, there's a lot of land down there. There's, a, there's, okay, but this is what happened on the last year. <coughs> all right, there weren't that many left, right? There, there weren't that many of the people who were 20 at the time, 20 and above at the time of the of, of the sin of the Moroccan, right? So those people, Osha says, okay, go out and dig. 15, all the people who are left, go out and dig. And the next morning, they woke up. And they thought, huh, you must have gotten the day wrong. You know, must have miscalculated the calendar. And they go and they do it again that next night. And they did it again the next night. Same thing keeps happening. They keep waking up. And they did it the 10th and the 11th and the 12th and the 13th. And finally on the night, and finally in the morning of the 15th, they say, no, no, they, no, the, I'm sorry, the night of the 15th, they, no. They see the full moon. They say, we could not possibly have miscalculated that. The full moon, it means it's ended. The curse has ended. Okay, so this was the 15th of the month of Av. And we know that there are many, many things that happen on the 15th of Av, but it becomes this day of great simcha, right? Can you imagine, like, after you've been watching all these years, you've been in the desert, you're watching all these years, and you're thinking people die every 
And on that day, there's, it's a day of tremendous simcha. And as a matter of fact, the girl says that it says further in the Mishnah, the girls go out and they and they're dancing. It says, Hayu Yamim Tobim Li Israel. Um uh, sorry, sorry, Lo Hayu Yamim Tobim Li Israel, Kihamisha Asar Ba'av, Ukiyom Hakipurim. There were not days of you know, holidays, se celebrating, joy, simcha, like the days of the 15th of Av and Yom Kippur. And then it goes on to say that the the uh, notes of Yerushalayim, um, Yotzeot Cholot Bekir uh, Kiramim, okay, that the daughters of Jerusalem went out and they danced in the vineyards for the purpose of finding a shiva. We'll get to that. And so it's, 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 there's something very special about this day. And as a matter of fact, so I'm going to talk about this. There were six important things that uh, happened on that day. So the first is that the, that, that, the, that the people stopped dying. Okay. Secondly, there were, there were certain prohibitions against the tribes intermarrying with each other. There were actually two. Um, one is a very terrible, terrible story. Called is about the Giva, the Pelegish Giva. You've read that story. It's really a, a, a very low moment in, in, in Jewish history. And the story goes, goes like this: there, there was a, a Levi who lived in Harafraim, and he had a Pelegish. She had a concubine, and she ran away from him. So we can see he's like a really sweet guy. And and he, she she goes to her father's home, and and. Uh, Finally, after four months, I don't know, ran out of socks. I, and I, uh, okay, I shouldn't make jokes. I shouldn't make jokes. Really, gotta stop that. Um, she, yeah, right. Um, so she, he goes to her father's house and he's received very well. You know, it's the, the, his father-in-law is happy to see him and greets him and greets him. And, it, and, and, and finally, his concubine, his Pelegish, agrees to go back home with him. But the father keeps delaying them one day to this day. You know, you'll refresh yourself, you'll go tomorrow. You know, day after day after day. Finally, you know, he's got to get free. He wants to get home, and he and he leaves. And unfortunately, he leaves. It's not early in the day. He leaves in the middle of the day. There's not much time for for them to to get to another to a safe place, a place where they could stay comfortably for the night. And they arrive in this town of Giva, in the, in the, which is in the territory of of, Afra, of um, Binyamin. And they and they they're in the town, the center of town, the city. You know the I don't know, the central square, whatever it was, and there's nobody there, you know, and they're like, uh, are we gonna be sleeping here tonight? I, finally, there's an old man who comes from the field late at night and he sees them and he said, no, you can't spend your night here, come to my home. And, you know, he gives them hospitality appropriately and they're settling in and suddenly there's a, a lot of noise outside and banging on the door. And there's a, a group of terrible people outside who say, and say, you know, we we want that man, you know, like shades of blood. You know, we want send, send out this man. And and the and the this, this host refuses to, to, to treat his guests that way. He gives them the pelegish. This 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 this, this, this concubine is put outside. And these terrible people do terrible things to her all night long. And and then did you ever hear this? And in the morning, she like manages to crawl back to the door of the, of the home where she's staying and she dies on the doorstep. And the lady comes out in the morning, he's like, he wants to get back on the, on the road and he sees her there and eh, nice guy, wait, wake up, nothing. And he understands that she's dead. And he takes her body and he puts her on the, his donkey and he goes to his home in Howard Fry and he cuts her body up into 12 pieces, right? And sends it to every single tribe, along with telling them the story. And it's an outrage. I mean, the people are, you know, like nothing like this has ever happened in our land since we settled this land. Nothing like this has ever happened. And they're, they're outraged. They're just, you know, they can't. So they, they establish an army. Hundreds, thousands of people from every single tribe gather together and they go to Binyamin and they say, they send, send representatives to Binyamin and they say, 
give us these people. We want to we wanna punish them. They, they deserve to be punished. And Binyamin says, no, these are our people. We'll take care of it. It becomes like a state's rights versus you know, federalism, right? It's like, you know, it's our right to have slaves. No, you have to free the slaves. Let's make a war. And they did. They made, they made a civil war. So it was 400,000 troops against 26,000 Binyaminim. Didn't go well for Binyamin. It did not go well. And you know, the first day they go into battle, many, many thousands are killed. Meanwhile, the the you know the the righteous neighbors are outraged, but we're a righteous nation, and they go to Hashem and they inquire, is this the right thing to do? And they get the answer, yes. And they go again, and they you know that do more more people are killed. Finally, go again. Should we should we you know finish the job? They're told, I guess through the order of the tour, meme, or even the tour meme, that yes, you should you, you should. You do it. And they basically destroy Sheikh bin Yaman. I mean, there's, there's some sources that say they burnt their houses, they killed all their livestock, all the women were killed. The only people remaining of, of Sheikh bin Yaman were 600 men, and they were hiding out on, the, on, a, on a rock in the you know, they're hiding, hiding out. And at that point, you know, the, the, the rest of the tribes have a feeling of great regret. You know, what have we done? And they, and they, um, they're, you know, they're sorry they did that. And they say, how, how could it be that at one shade of, of Am Yisrael is going to disappear? No, we can't, we can't have that. And they, and we, so we have to help them. And we have to help them rebuild. And helping them rebuild means giving them wives. Like, how do they, and, um, but they've made a vow that they won't allow the tribes to intermarry with Binyamin. So what do they do? <laughs> so there is sakalacha that you first of all you, you that you can't give your daughters to these men in marriage doesn't mean they can't take them. I'm not leaving out some details. There were actually two two hundred men left at this point who were unmarried, and and the next generation can intermarry with the young. So they tell them go to Shiloh. Every year in Shiloh, on this day, the 15th of Av, there's a big holiday. Everybody comes out, all the girls come out, they dance in the, in the vineyard, go out, grab, grab, a, grab a nice girl. <laughs> okay, and so it hasn't violated the, the, the um, yeah. ban of, of marrying, of intermarrying between tribes. And at the same time, they make the, the, the same thing happen. Remember the story of the Benoist Club Club? Right, Slavka's daughters came to Moshe Rabbeinu. They're talking about dividing up the land, and they say, "What? We're, because we're because our father had no sons. That means he's not going to get any part in the in the in the in the land." And so the sock comes down. Hashem, what? Yeah, <laughs> the sock comes down. Yes, you can. You, you, they can inherit. But they can't, they can't marry anybody outside of their tribe. Because if they were to do that, the, 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 the land would be transferred to somebody to another tribe. So also on this day, on the 15th of Av, they determined that, the Chazal determined, they made a that this, that this um, only applied to, um, to, to the generation that, um, that, that was in the Midbar. And once they had settled and the land had been distributed, there was no longer any limitation on people Intermarry. So two two important things happened on that day that that result because actually if you think about it, this was really a, it was something like, it, it was a punishment against the women mostly you know that they couldn't marry who they wanted right so that, so it, it was determined that that from that day on from after the fifteenth of of Av the, these women could go out and they could um, marry whoever they want so that's what happened the second and third events that happened on the fifteenth of of Av. Okay, the next, the next thing um, is the, um, the uh, Hosea ben Ela, who was the last king of the, of the uh, northern, northern kingdom. He agreed to take down the barriers that prevented all the Jews of the 10 tribes from going to Yerushalayim. Okay, at the time of, after, after Shlomo Melech died, right, his, his uh, successor was his son Rukhavim. And Rechavim, I guess he got bad advice, and he, 
you know, he's a little bit of a, 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 a he was a bit of a Balgaiba, and he decided, how am I gonna treat my new subjects? I'm the king, I'm the good. And how am I gonna treat my, my subjects? I'm gonna be tough with them. I'm gonna be, show them that I'm the king. And he demanded very high taxes. It wasn't cheap living under Shlomo either, but he, he increased taxes, he made all kinds of demands on them. And the people, you know, mutiny. 10 tribes made a decision that they're separating from, from, the, from the Am and they're establishing their own kingdom. And they, and they, and they appointed Yarovam ben Nevat to be, to be the king. And, and he had been a, he was a Talmud Chacham, he was considered a very fine person. But you know, when a person's in power, you know, power, power is very dangerous. And over time, he had a problem with the fact that for all the Shlosh Rogalim, the Jews were going to Yerushalayim and they would see this king and they would sing this, see this glorious face of Mikdash and they would see the Avoda and they would see the Kafanos. And they didn't like the idea that maybe they had some loyalty to the rest of, to this other part of, of, of Amisra, that they had some connection with this other Jewish people. And over time, so he put, guard, he put guards, which would prevent the people from going to Yerushalayim. There, there were blockades in different places. And eventually he came to set up idols. And the people were not able to, to go to Yerushalayim and, okay, here's a God substitute for you. Yeah, and they began to, many people became, became idol worshipers. Many, and this existed for many generations. There were many kings that, that followed Yerushalayim. And so finally we got to Hosea ben Elah, who said, if you want to go to Yerushalayim, you can go to Yerushalayim. If you want to pray there, you can pray there. I'm not stopping you. And he was not, he wasn't such a good man. I mean, he really was a Russian. He was, a, he was an idol worshiper. He was not a, not a good fellow, but he, he allowed this small margin of, of, uh, of choice. Thank you. Yeah, you're here to, it's still in my words to me. Thank you. Who <laughs> goes? <laughs> Okay, so, and, and but um, fortunately, shortly thereafter, the Assyrians came from the north, attacked the 10 tribes. How did the 10 tribes get lost? This is how the 10 tribes got lost. They were taken by the Assyrians. We don't really know what happened to them. They were moved to different territories. They were killed. They were absorbed into the general population. We don't really know. But, and the reason why this happened so quickly after um, Hoshea had, had done this thing was because at the time that these other kings were, were the kings of the, of the 10 tribes, right? The, the, the fact that the Jewish people were not going to Yerushalayim, that they were, they were worshiping idols, that they were not doing what they were supposed to do, it was on the king's head. I'm doing this because this is what the king's making me do. He's not letting me go to, bring, to, go to the base of Mikdash. It's on him. Well, suddenly when you open the door, it's not on him. It's on you too. You have a, cho a choice. You have a decision whether you want to go and you want to worship properly and you want to serve Hashem properly. And the fact that they didn't, they were destroyed. And the other, just there, but there were people who did go to Yerushalayim. And that's how we know that, that all of these 10 tribes, there were some remnants of each of the tribes that survived. Not all of the people, that, not all of the tribes were completely destroyed. There were people from every single tribe who moved to, to Binyamin or moved to Yehuda or moved to Yerushalayim and they survived. So we had some remnants of the Jewish people. Um, okay, so that's number four. And, um, but the day that they were, the day that they were allowed to go to Yerushalayim was the 15th of Av. Great day of celebration, right? The, the, the door is, you want to go serve, serve Hashem in the base of Mikdash? It's a great, it's a great day. That was the 15th of Av. Okay, the, the next thing that happened, it was the last day of cutting wood to be used in the base of Mikdash. Now the wood that, that was used in the, the Mizbeah, right, and it's a lot of wood, there's a lot of carbono, so, so it had to be completely pure, had to be completely free of any kind of bugs. And um, if, the, if there was a little bit of moisture in, in the wood, then it would sort of, it would be an opportune environment for 
for the um, for, for worms and bugs to go into the into the wood. So they made a determination. What on the on the fifteenth of Av, so the the strength of the the rays of the sun weakened. Right, the days began to get shorter. The days the, the rays of the sun weakened, and at that point, the, the, there wouldn't be sufficient time for the for the wood to dry. Right, it was, it was to get it was harvested from starting in Nissan up until the fifteenth of Av. There wouldn't be sufficient time for it to dry out to be used for in the base of Mikdash. So from that day on, it was not, it was not used. Any, no, no, no more wood was, was used. And they actually like broke the broke their axes. And, and it was a day of tremendous celebration. It was a day of, of great happiness, 15 the bumps, great celebration. You know, why was it a celebration exactly? Well, I mean, one, one reason that's given is that because the people were no longer chopping wood, so they they were they had more time to learn, but um, the the uh, it was actually this it was a huge mitzvah that they gave this wood. You know, when when uh, Ezra and Nehemiah came back from Babel to Eretz Israel and they brought the Jewish people, well, sort of, they brought forty two thousand people came with them. Very small number of people came up with that, and the land was sort of like how we found it when we first started in the, more, in the modern period, the land was desolate. I mean, there was, and they managed to harvest enough trees to build the, the base on Mikdash. But after that, there was not very much, it wasn't very much wood. Wood was a, was a very rare commodity. And, and they had to turn to certain families, interestingly, the, the Gemara lists the names and the dates of when certain families would deliver wood, would donate wood. And it's a tremendous, it was a tremendous festival. They called it, you know, carbon ha It's not really a carbon, but they called it carbon ha eights. Because if you think about it, you know, somebody gives the data, so I give stuff to you, to you, to you. I, I, one, I, one person, right? When somebody gave this, 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 uh, this wood, they were actually giving this carbon to and the entire nation. Everybody was benefiting from it. And it was, it was considered, was considered to be a, um, a a huge huge mitzvah, and they and and um, I mean it wasn't really even a mitzvah. It's called a hechsher mitzvah, right? We we have certain things that we do not really mitzvah. There's no mitzvah to build the sukkah. You have to build the sukkah in order to be able to sit in the sukkah. So it's called a hechsher mitzvah. You don't have to you don't have to grow grapes and, and harvest you know grapes to make wine. But you do need to do that in order to be able to make Kiddush, which is a mitzvah on, on wine. So they didn't need to give this wood. But how are you going to be able to do all the things on the base of Mikdash if you didn't have this, have this, have this wood? So it became this tremendous gift. And it was considered so for in gratitude to the, for, for successfully completing this mitzvah of gathering all the wood that they needed for all of the sacrifices that would take place until the next year when, when wood could be gathered again and, and dried and used in the service. So they had this, this huge celebration and that was the 15th of August. And the last thing that took place, it's another sad portion, and that is that they were allowed to bury the dead who had been killed in Beitar. So this was um, this story took place after the destruction of the second base of Mikdash, probably I don't know, 50, 60 years after the base of Mikdash. You know, when when um, you know the Romans were in control of the land, but the whole time, I mean, you know, Jews were just like, yes, master. You know, they, there was a lot of subversion. There was a lot of efforts to to throw them over, and and probably the the most famous of that period is what's called the Great Revolt. The story of, of uh, Bar Kokhba, right? We know we know about the Bar Kokhba's revolt, and um, Bar, Bar Kokhba was was actually quite successful at first. It says that he killed, he managed to destroy two Roman legions. A legion is five thousand men. You know, here's like the great vaunted, you know, uh, um, Roman Empire controlling the world, and you know these little schmuckly little Jews with their little you know makeshift weapons. They managed to to destroy, to, to cause immense damage, you know, to, to against the Romans. But 
you know, the Romans, it was a matter of time. The Romans were not going to let that happen. So they sent more men and more men and they came. And I mean, they, you know, Bachov was so successful that, that they thought he was the Mashiach. He started rebuilding the, the base of Mikdash, right? Rabbi Akiva said he's the Mashiach, right? And, and he could have been the Mashiach, except that he lost. And the Romans came and they destroyed this town of Betar. It had been a very popular city, lots and lots of people living in Betar. It said the blood, it was, it was up to people's ankles and the blood flowed. There were so many people who died. There was so much blood, the blood flowed to the sea. Yeah. Yeah, it's a long way. I don't know, I don't know. So this is, this is uh, Mediterranean. Oh, no, no, I, I might have been Mediterranean. I don't know. It probably would have been the Dead Sea, but that's a little closer. It's all downtown. I, I mean, it, it's, it's sort of Mediterranean. And it's to illustrate the point of how much blood, how many, how much, how many people were killed. So um, Adrianus, Hadrian, was such an evil person that he refused to allow these people to be buried. And he had this huge vineyard and, and huge pieces of land. And he said, we're going to use these bodies. And we're going to make a wall. And he stacked the bodies. I was like, not sure if this was Tisha Torah when I started. Uh, I think it is. What do you think? They stacked the bodies, you know, and they made a wall around this. The wall was 725, oh, sorry, 400, 545 miles long if you heard it like that is a lot of a lot of dead people that is a lot of dead people and they and they, um yeah was it a wall with two on top of it i don't know i mean it was a wall that surrounded his his vineyard um and and uh, and it was and they stayed like this for 13 years Right. I mean, if you've ever had the experience of like the, the, if you've ever had this experience of you know like a, a loved one for whatever reason can't be buried for for a few days, it is such a sara. It is so much pain. Like we have so much respect for 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 the dead that we you know run. You know who does a funeral at night? I mean we do. You know because because you can't leave a bed. You, you try and get the body through as early as you possibly can. Thirteen years. They're they're. And then a new, a new uh, Caesar came into power, and he, on the 15th of Av, he allowed the bodies to be buried. The body, the dead people of Betar were buried. And as a matter of fact, we, the, the fourth bracha of Birchas Hamazon, Hatov Meiti, was established at that point. Hatov, because he preserved the bodies, that he did not rot. And Meiti, that he allowed them to be buried. Did he keep them up there that long just waiting for them to rot, maybe? And then he realized they weren't rotting? I, no, I, I, think, he, I, I think he wasn't even, didn't give her really that much thought. He just, in his cruelty, he just said, these people will not be buried. And he knew that it was, I mean, I think in any society, it's, it's a cruelty. You know, to leave people, right? It's, it's, it's by any measure, it's, it's, it's an immense cruelty. But, but, but it turned around that day. It, it, it turned around. So we, we and, 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 you know, it became a day of, of tremendous happiness. I mean, it's a little hard to call that a day of happiness, right? But, but you have to think of, you have to realize like where they were living, what they were living in, right? They, the, the times that they were living in, the, the, the pain and the suffering that the people of that era, I mean, you know, we, we know Holocaust, you know, we know, you know, you can't, you can't imagine the kind of, 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 of suffering that, that they went through at that time. So when you have something like that, it's like, it's like Hashem, they didn't rot, they didn't decay, and, can be, and they can be buried. And it's like, like Hashem saying, I remember you. I know I feel very far. You feel that I'm very far, but I remember you. I'm with you. So we have these 15 things that happened that became, you know, that became great happy days. Um, in, in a way, there, there's a correspondence between them and the things that happened on, that, that the Mishnah talks about that happened on Tisha B'Av, right? There's, there's, a very, there's a close relationship. So we, it says you can't enter the land, right? So when the, when the Jews 
stop dying in the Midbar, we could enter the land. That, that was the result of it. That began the process of, of, of um, capturing the land and settling the land and dividing up the, the land. I mean, it was, it, was, it, it was a moment of turning the corner. It was a moment of, of, of transformation. It was a moment of rectification. Things became, went from being very, very dark to being hopeful, to being something that, that, that people could be happy about. Okay, so the, the Hurban by Rishon, so we know that one of the terrible things that people did during that time, and one of the reasons why the Beis Mikdash was destroyed was because of idol worship. So we have the, the acts of El Sheh, Ben Ela, you don't have to worship idols, you can go. I'm giving you this opportunity to not worship idols. Um, the cutting of wood, it became, the, it's, the, it's the business of the Beis Mikdash. What's the Beis Mikdash for? It's basically, it's to, you know, the business of the Beis Mikdash was to offer sacrifices. It needs wood. The wood became available to become part of the normal practice and procedure of the of the service of the of the Beis Mikdash. They by Cheni. Um, the the reason by Cheni was was destroyed was because sinas chinam, right? Because people were 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 disrespectful of each other. Well, if that uh, starting on the 15th of August, people could intermarry. The tribes could intermarry. I can love you, you can love me, we can love each other, right? We, we, it became a whole different relationship with, with and there were no roadblocks. Like, you know, you could, you could now go and be with the United Am, and, we'll, and we love each other and we respect each other. Um, and Beitar, obviously burying the dead was, was, was the rectification for, for, the, for the destruction, um, for, the, for the killing in Beitar. And finally, plowing, plowing the land, plowing Yerushalayim. I mean, you know, the different opinions about what was plowed under. Was it Eichel? Was it all of Yerushalayim? Basically, plow, plowing under the land is, there's no, no bit of it left. We're erasing every bit of you in this land. We're removing every sign that you were ever here. And then that changed. Didn't they also use salt? Maybe. I heard the Romans would water the salt of the land for growing. Could be, could be. There's a, there's a lot of a lot of a lot of different opinions about what exactly that that expression means. So, but they but they could enter the land and they could begin rebuilding the land and rebuild the base of Mikdash and rebuild our lives as 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 Jews in service to Hashem on that day. So, um, okay. So it's it's a complete. It's it's a turnaround. Things have changed. It's a, it's a it's it's a new it's a new day, and and um, and it was a day of joy. So I'll just go back to the mission. I started rubbing through from Anshibet Gamliel. Lo hayat hayu yamim tovim the Israel kechamisha aser ba'av ukiyom hakipurim. So I mean the obvious question here is like. 15th of Av and Yom Kippurim. There's no holiday in, in, in our calendar as big as, you no, know, I mean, Yom Kippur you get, right? 15th of Av, I mean, like, we barely, it's, it's only halakhic significance is that you don't say Tachnun, and if you're getting married on that day, say, you don't have to fast. <laughs> so, I mean, that's, that's and, and do we know about it? I mean, we barely even know that the, the for, for hundreds and hundreds of years, it was celebrated. As a, as a great day of joy. It was something. But there's something that both days have in common. There's something that, that's common to both of these things. So what do we know about Yom Kippur? Why is that? What, why that day? And that was the day that, that Hashem brought the second set of luchos. Hashem gave Moshe the second set of luchos and they were brought to the Jewish people. And what we understand from that day, what that day meant, is that Hashem finally forgave us. And Hashem, it, 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 it's like, here's a new ksuva. Here's, here's, here's our marriage contract. Here, we're going to re, renew our vows. We're going to, Hashem says, okay, I forgive you, and I love you, and I'm going to entrust you with my precious Torah, and you are my children. 
And the day completely was a day of complete turnaround. It was a day when everything, everything changed. And 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 the and the same thing on on Abisha also the the Ab. It was a day that everything turned around. Everything changed. So many things changed. So then it says, so the um so Shabahan Binos Yerushalayim Yotzot, the Kli Laban Shulim. And they, you know, they, they're, they're going out. Like, I mean, like how would people look at it in this day and age, right? Like the girls are dancing in front of men, you know, and that's how, this, this was the Shinnach process. These, these girls would go out and dance, right? And they would, men would come and they would pick their column. I mean, who, who, who would, how could, how could. I know people who are not Okay, but the, but, but the, <laughs> Okay, but okay, but what the um, but the day, both of those days, were such holy days that there wasn't the least little bit, the smallest bit of any kind of taiva, of inappropriate action. People like doing, you know, doing the the do anything that was inappropriate. You know, it says that, that during certain festivities, you know, that the base did would send agents to put up a barrier to separate men from women because there would be, um, you know, they were afraid that there would be inappropriate behavior. It was not necessary. They decided it wasn't necessary. How could somebody who's just gone through the whole process of being forgiven, somebody who's gone through this, you know, through through this purification? And understands that they're, you know, that they're that they're finally being forgiven. You know, how, how are they gonna? How, how are they gonna? You're gonna then like get all, you know, schmutzy? No, you know, it's like us. You know, the 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 you're not walking out of shul on you know, Rosh Hashanah night. You know, like bad mouthing your neighbor. That's not the first thing you do. You know, you take your first glass of of, of, of water and you go shout on your mouth. You, you know, you you're, you say your first bracha with intent. You you know you're clean. You are clean and you're forgiven and you're pure and you want to sustain that for as much as, as as long as you possibly can. And 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 then and and so they went out without any fear of taiva and without any fear of impropriety. And it says that the that the, the that the girls wore white uh, dresses. That they had borrowed, right? They didn't wear their own dresses, right? Because and and um, and they, you know, it says like the the, the daughter of the Kohen Gadol would, would borrow from the king's daughter, and the you know the king's the Kohen Gadol's daughter would lend to the Sagan, you know, uh, Kohen Gadol's daughter, and everybody would lend to everybody else. Nobody did tap, and nobody had better than anybody else. Okay, nobody should be embarrassed about what they have and what they don't have. And they also were very strict. It says, call um, um, uh, Okay, they were very careful about it. So all the all the, these dresses were were dipped in a in a in a mikvah because they were very concerned in those days about about purity and they didn't want anybody to be embarrassed. They didn't want anybody um, were you Nida before you put this dress on? They want anybody to have any discomfort. In other words, like what this represents is a, a tremendous level of sensitivity to, to, to other people. And then the girls, so they would go out, okay, the yotz alot, the karmim, okay, so they're going out and they're dancing in the, in the vineyards, dancing. Oh, <laughs> sorry, I can't help it. Okay, I, I thought at least, maybe I'll just tell bad jokes. I know. Um, and so mahu um, omrot, what did they say? Before Samai Necha Ure, lift up your eyes and see. Ma Atabor, what are you choosing? Which what are you going to be choosing? And I'll teach a Necha Benoi. Don't put your eyes on beauty. Okay, don't don't look for the Tene Necha the Mishpacha. Put your eyes on focus your eyes on family. And who is going to be the best? Okay, who, who is going to create, what's the important thing? You want, to, want me to stop? You want to get into a chair? 
Is that for a minute? I really have like five more minutes. Okay. Who who is going to be who is who is the best person to marry? Someone who's going to help you to build the Bayit Nehman of Israel. Somebody who's going to be who's going to be making for you a fine home. Somebody who cares about the important things. It says. Um, 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 uh, okay, Sheker Achem, Hevel Yofi. Okay, we know this from every Friday night. We hear this. Okay, that the charm is, is, is fake and beauty is, is, is vanity, it's nothing. Um, re, um, uh, okay, um, Isha Yuras Hashem, who you tell them? Okay, so the woman who, 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 is, um, who fears Hashem, that's who you should respect. That's who you have to, to go after. It's a, it's a lesson in, in like how to pick a, pick a proper life. You're dancing in the field on Yom Kippur. You're dancing in the field on the holy day of, of Sheva Asr B'Tammuz. And you're telling you what's the proper way to make a home. What's the proper, and, and, and getting married and building a home. Is that not a, 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 how you repair the destruction that took place and all this destruction that took place to, among Am Yisrael? How do you build up the people? It was a complete and total turnaround. Okay, and, and you know, we're, we're, we're moving towards that season. Here, we're on this day. It's the lowest of the low. The lowest of the low. The Jewish people is compared to the moon, right? And, you know, we have our very low moments, we practically disappear, and then we have full moons, and, we, and we're, we're obvious, where we, be, we come out big and, and great. And that's what we're moving towards. We're at, we were, we're at this low point, and now we're moving towards this great point. And what begins at this, at this part, and the, the 15th of Av, you know, there are people who have the, the custom to, to begin to say, Ksiva v'chasima tova, Hativa v'chatima tova. They begin wishing them that you should be written into the book of, of, for life and signed into the book of life. In other words, it's the season for starting tshuva. <laughs> That's what's coming up next. We're not so far from, you know, Yom Kippur, very close, all of it's very, uh, Kodesh Av, very close. We're beginning, remember the, the, um, the, um, uh, who is it? The, uh, B'nai Yisachar says that the gematria, Chamisha, Chamisha Eser Ba'av is equivalent to Ksiva the Chasimah Pretty darn good. <laughs> yeah. Do, do math there. Um, it, you know, this, this month is equivalent to the beginning of the, this day is the equivalent to the beginning of this period of, of tshuva. So we should all move on from this very sad day and move on to, to a period of rectification, to turning around, to changing things that we don't want to be living with anymore, to ch turning our lives around, and beginning anew, and renewing our relationship with Hashem, and getting to a, a high place. Amen. It's a good moment to change the chair. <laughs> Thank you.